grab a hold of these truths you have for us is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's go back to Matthew 5 and verse number 3 together what it says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at this statement now. Mount of Blessings, page 13. Let's read this together, what it says. Throughout the Beatitudes, there is an advancing line of Christian experience. And these are the Beatitudes. And there are nine Beatitudes. And the Bible says, if I want to advance in the line of Christian experience, I must take this first step. And what is the first step? The first Beatitude? Blessed are the poor in spirit. If you want to advance in the Christian experience, you must also take this first step. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And this word beatitude is a compound word. Be, being, attitude. Your thoughts from which we have words, from which we have our actions. This Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven and what is the first step in the advancing line of christian experience we must be how poor in spirit how many of us want to receive god's kingdom how many of us want to enter god's kingdom that the bible says blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven if i want to make it in i must acknowledge i am poor in spirit if you want to make it into God's kingdom, New Jerusalem, what must you also acknowledge? That you are poor in spirit. And what does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does that mean, poor in spirit? What does that mean? All right. This phrase, poor in spirit, has three primary applications. How many? Three. The first one is... Poor in spirit means that we lack spirituality. We lack the power of the Holy Spirit. If we are going to make it into God's kingdom, we must sincerely confess that we lack the power of the Holy Spirit. We are poor in spirit. Not only must I acknowledge this to God, but I must ask him to supply this need. Not only must you acknowledge that you lack the Holy Spirit of God, but you must sincerely ask him to supply that need. What need? To impart to you the power of the Holy Spirit. Hold your place in Matthew chapter 5. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Where are we going to, friends? Luke chapter 11. Blessed Father in heaven, pour out your Spirit upon us. Help us to see our need today is our prayer in Christ's name. Where are we going to? Luke chapter 11. We are dealing with the first step in the advancing line of Christian experience. Blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, we must all see our need to receive God's Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, not only to receive it, but to retain that power. We must see that need every single day. Not only must I see it, you must see it, but you must also ask for it. And once we ask, the Bible says, we shall receive. This is why it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke chapter 11, verse number 13. Are we there? So what's that first definition of being poor in spirit? We see our lack of the power of the Holy Spirit, or a lack of spirituality. Not only must I see it, but I must ask, verse 13 together, what it says. If you then, being evil, know how to give up good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give you whom? Give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. So once I ask, once you ask for the power of the Holy Spirit, once we see our need, the promise is God will grant this unto us. If that is clear, my friends, say amen. This is why we are blessed. The opposite, the contrast is also true. If I refuse to realize and acknowledge I am poor in spirit, then I won't ask for the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus will not supply 
the power of the Holy Spirit. Likewise for you, if you refuse to see your need for the power of the Holy Spirit, that you are poor in spirit and ask God to supply the need of the power of the Holy Spirit, then Jesus will not impart the power of the Holy Spirit to you. I cannot be saved without it. You cannot be saved without the power of the Holy Ghost, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the character of Jesus Christ. Chapter 4 of the Ephesians, verse number 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. If I don't see my need, if you don't see your need, if I don't ask daily for this uh, power of the Holy Spirit, if you don't ask, all of us will be lost. I don't want to be lost. Do you want to be lost? Chapter 3 of the Revelation. Go there with me. Chapter 3. Revelation. Let's take a look at this group of people called lukewarm Laodiceans. And the Bible tells us that they refuse to realize that they are poor in spirit. They refuse to realize they lack the power of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. They refuse to acknowledge this and to ask for Jesus to fulfill that need. As a result, they are going to be lost. And this is a time period all of us are now living in. I am either hot or lukewarm. You are either hot or lukewarm. Look with me. Chapter 3 of the Revelation, verse number 14, mentions the church of the Laodiceans, those living in the time of judgment, investigative judgment in preparation for rewards. Skip on down to verse 17. It says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of what? Nothing. So what are these folks saying, friends? that they are in need of nothing, that they are rich. Do they acknowledge that they are poor in spirit? No, they profess that what? They are rich, increased with goods, and are in need of nothing. But what does Jesus say? You don't even know. Let's read that, verse 17. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So Jesus says to his professed people in the last days, you are poor and don't even know it. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So if I do not acknowledge before God sincerely that I am poor in spirit, I lack spirituality. If you do not do likewise, if I don't ask him daily, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. If you do not do likewise, then Jesus cannot supply our need. He would not impart to us the power of the Holy Spirit. And those who refuse to acknowledge their need and ask Jesus for the power of the Holy Spirit, these people are going to be spewed out of Christ's mouth, which means you are going to be cut off, be lost. Verse 16 to confirm. It says, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor. So why would Jesus spew out of his mouth uh, the lukewarm Laodiceans? Why? Based on verse 17, why? They refuse to acknowledge that they are poor. And we are told in Testimonies for the Church, volume 4, page 8 to 7, the only hope for the Laodiceans is to see their standing before God to realize Jesus says you don't even know that you are poor, that you lack spirituality. This is our only hope. What does it mean then to be spewed out of Christ's mouth? Write down on your note paper, Leviticus chapter 18, 
verse 27, Leviticus 18, verse 27, verse 29. To be spewed out means to be cut off. Write down Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, verse 33. Jesus says, spewing out of his mouth, Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. He will spew you out of his mouth. And if Jesus does not, intercede for me if Christ does not intercede for you we are lost if we so live that Christ says I will spew you out then we are lost people my friends chapter 13 of the revelation so now the first application of being poor in spirit is what what do you have on your paper there being poor in spirit that you lack spirituality you lack the power of the Holy Spirit. You lack the character of Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Now, there's a second application for blessed are the poor in spirit. And this application is we are poor in faith. We lack the faith of Jesus. Put it down on your, on your paper. We lack the faith of Jesus to endure the crises of life. And there is a great crisis coming. It makes no sense we say that we are ready for it because we are unprepared for it. And the only way we can make it is one, to acknowledge we are poor in spirit. To acknowledge we lack the faith of Jesus. We are poor in spirit. We lack the faith of Jesus Christ to endure the coming crisis. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. And once we acknowledge it, we must ask him now for that spirit, the spirit of faith, asking now for the faith of Jesus in order to endure the coming crisis. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Again, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But before we can enter into Christ's kingdom, we all have to go through a crisis. Jesus Christ, when he came, walked this earth, died, and he rose on the third day based on scripture. The Bible says Christ did not return to heaven until he went through the crisis of the cross. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For, there, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We will make it until we go through a what? A crisis, my friends. And to go through this crisis, we must first acknowledge we are poor in spirit. Ask Jesus for the faith, the spirit of faith and truth to endure the coming crisis. Write down on your note paper the, the great controversy. What book did I say? Great controversy. Page 622 says, listen carefully, it says, the time of trouble, the what, friends? The time of trouble, such as never was, is soon to open upon us. And we shall need an experience, a what? An experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent to obtain and which many are too lazy to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. Blessed are the what? The poor in spirit. What does that mean in the second application? That we lack the faith to go through the coming crisis. On page 621, Put it down. On page 621, it's on your sermon notes too, but take your own notes. Amen. On page 621 of Great Controversy, it reads, The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith. A faith that can endure weariness. A faith that can endure delay. A faith that can endure hunger. A faith that will not faint Though it is severely tried, 
This period of probation has been granted to all to prepare for that time. Blessed are the whom? The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We can't make it in until we go through crises. We lack the faith to endure. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. So what must we do then? Acknowledge that we are poor in spirit. We lack spirituality. We lack the faith of Jesus to endure the coming great crisis. Look with me. Chapter 13 of Revelation. And these current events that are transpiring all around us, they show us the kingdom of heaven is soon to become a reality. Is that clear? But before the kingdom of heaven becomes a reality, we all have to go through a crisis. And what does the Bible call this great crisis of the ages? The mark of the beast. Chapter 13 of Revelation. So do we have the faith to go through this crisis? Who shall receive the blessing? Those who say, Lord, I am poor in spirit. I lack the spirituality to make it. I lack the faith of Jesus to make it. When all is said and done, those who go through the mark of the beast crisis and come out victorious by the help of Christ, Christ will say, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Chapter 13 of Revelation. Verse number 3 mentions the deadly wound. The what, friends? The deadly wound of the papacy will one day be healed. And verse 4 says, when that deadly wound of popery, Roman Catholicism, is completely healed. All the world will be compelled to worship on Sunday by law. This is now going to be the mark of the beast. Sunday worship enforced by law. And those who refuse to bow will not be able to buy or sell. They will be verbally and physically chastised and persecuted. They, will also, they are going to be martyrs. They are going to be killed. Do we have the faith to endure this crisis? So who is the blessing for? Those who see their need. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What happened yesterday? February 12th, 2016. It's, let's pass that. It says on Catholic News Agency, last week I touched on this, but that was only part one. You see what God is going to share with us now. The world is saying the meeting between Pope Francis and the Russian patriarch, the Russian Orthodox Church, is the first in history since the year 1084, 1054, when there was a great schism, a great separation in the general Catholic Church. It was divided into two parts. Roman Catholic and Greek Catholic Church. Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Two groups, one schism. And we are told, we are told, friends, in this historian writing, J. N. Andrews, it says, here it is, the Catholic Church was divided into what, friends? Two churches. What are they? The Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Catholic Church. Notice then he says, J. and Andrews, that there was a second schism in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic side, with the Protestant Reformation. Listen to me carefully now, friends. Why is that event yesterday, the meeting with Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church, not only is it historic, but prophetic? Now, the first of two schisms is now healed. Yes, the general Catholic Church officially is now, almost, I would say, completely healed. A few more things are left to take place. It's now done. One more schism is left to be healed, and that is uh, popery. Popery, bringing back under her wings and control uh, Protestants. 
And since February 12th, 2016, the first schism is history. It's now healed. This should awaken true Bible-believing Christians, Sabbath keepers, Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Look at this statement here. Why is this so important? This is uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. Last week I told you, back over, last week I told you, you have uh, the Roman Catholic Church and uh, the Greek Catholic Church. Listen carefully. The Greek Catholic Church, or we can call them, the Greek Orthodox Church, it's a general title, a general label and name. Under the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Greek Catholic Church, you have various churches. And the Russian Orthodox Church is a primary one under that heading. Is that clear, friends? This meeting was not only historic, but prophetic. Listen, it says, the Russian Orthodox Church, as well as the primate thereof, officially ranks what? Fifth in the Orthodox Order of Precedence immediately below the four ancient patriarchates of the Greek Orthodox Church. That's the label. Then it says those of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. The primary, come on now, let me make sure you're with me. What are the primary five Orthodox churches? What are they? We have the one in Constantinople, second, Alexandria, third, Antioch, fourth, Jerusalem, and what's number five? The Russian Orthodox Church. Hear me now. Pope Francis has met with all five. This is why it's so historic. All five he has met with and brought about a unification with each of the main five with the Roman Catholic Church. This is why this one yesterday with the Russian Orthodox Church is so historic and prophetic. Look at this carefully. Just in the same order, it says Reuters. And look at these dates. November 30th, 2014, Pope Francis. It says, in an address upon conclusion of the divine liturgy celebrated... By whom? Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew I at the Orthodox Church of St. George in where? Istanbul. Where is Constantinople today? Istanbul in Turkey. Listen what the Pope says now. He says, uh, he says, watch, the one thing the Catholic Church desires and that I, Pope Francis seeks, is what? as Bishop of Rome, is communion with whom the Orthodox churches is done. Since yesterday, look at this, uh, Reuters News. Uh, what's this, friends? September 30th, 2013. What's the headline here? Let's read. Pope Francis talks with Patriarch Theodore II of where? Alexandria. What now is number three? Antioch. Look at this. It says, uh, Vatican Radio. June 16, 2015, headline, let's read. Pope Francis to receive whom? Syrian Orthodox Patriarch. Syrian, that's Antioch. Number four, look friends, Vatican City. Date, May when? 28th, 2014. And the Pope met with whom? Not only the Patriarch from Constantinople, but also with whom? With Greek Orthodox Patriarch, Theophilus, the third of where? Jerusalem. All five. Here it is, friends. And notice now, there are five main churches under Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox. Five of them. One from Istanbul, Constantinople. Alexandria, Egypt. Third, Antioch, Syria. Number four, Jerusalem. And from Russia. Guess which one has the most influence? The one from Russia. Look at this. Vatican Crux, covering all things Catholic, February 12, 2016. It was the first ever meeting between whom? Come on, friends. The leaders of where? The Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches. The two largest 
Christian groups on each side of the rupture between Eastern and Western Christianity. Conventionally dated in the year 1054. That's why the meeting yesterday was what, friends? So historic and prophetic. Of all the five, the Russian Orthodox is the largest on the Eastern side. I began to do some research, friends. Hear me carefully. I said, Lord, I know the papacy, Pope wants to control every nation. And she will control the nations through religion. Pope will control America through Protestantism. Pope must control every nation through a religious element. Pope must control China. Is there an Orthodox church in China? And if yes, who controls it? It's Russia. Look, it says uh, the Chinese. The Chinese autonomous, what friends? Orthodox church was granted autonomy by its mother church. Who? The Russian Orthodox church in 1956. That must awaken you, friends. So now that tells me, since this union with Pope and the Russian Orthodox Church yesterday, now Pope can gradually control China. More completely now. Oh, friends, what about North Korea? Is there an Orthodox Church in North Korea? And who controls it? Russia. Listen to what this says. In 2006, the government of where North Korea supported the establishment of at least one Orthodox Christian parish of the Russian Orthodox Patriarchate in the capital of North Korea. This is why the meeting yesterday is not only historic, friends, but what? It is prophetic. This simple, very, very soon, when persecution begins then, wherever God's people are, whether in the West or in the East, persecution will come to God's people. So while we are sleeping in bed, while we're in church playing games, drinking in spoiled milk, partaking of moldy bread, diluted sermons, probation is fast closing. So I ask the question, do you have the faith to make it through this coming crisis? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh, friends, the two applications, what are they? Lord, I lack the spirituality to make it daily. I lack the faith of Jesus. As I ask, as you ask, Christ will now grant. Notice now, friends, it's history now. Past things. One Schism is now healed. But what is the second schism? Protestantism separated themselves from, from whom? From Pope. Now, so who is next for Pope to bring under her control? Protestantism. When will this take place? What year? In the year when, friends? In the year 2017. To be specific, October 31st, 2017 will be the official date when Pope Renau, the general Catholic Church, will now bring back under her Protestantism. The protest is over. So what is about to come upon God's Commandment keeping people, persecution, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who see their need and ask Jesus to supply that need. How close are we, my friends? I want to tell you something. And Pope is now making rapid steps to regain both symbolically and literally her lost domain, her lost territory, her lost dominion to bring protestantism back on her to silence the voice of protest very very soon what we are studying here at safe to serve will be called extremism and fundamentalism and this church must be stopped have you counted the cost blessed are the poor 
in spirit. And not to be beating your chest like Peter in the garden when Christ told him, tonight the shepherd shall be smitten and the sheep shall scatter. Peter said, Lord, I will stand with you. But when the crisis came, what happened to Peter? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Lord, I lack the experience. I lack the spirituality. Lord, I lack the faith of Jesus to endure the coming crises and the great crisis. Listen what this says. Yesterday, friends, Religion News Service, February 10th, 2016. It says, Henry, King Henry VIII, his chapel did what, friends? Host Catholic prayers for what? The first time in 450 years. Pause. Why is it on the Pope Francis, his papacy, all we are hearing are these firsts? All these firsts. Probation's hour is fast closing. Was England a stronghold for the Protestant Reformation? It says for the first time. In 450 years, a citadel of Protestant worship in England, the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court Palace echoed the what? The sound, echo to the sound of Roman Catholic prayers and music. Is Pope reclaiming her lost dominion before our very eyes? What happened in Scotland? What's coming to Scotland? Was Scotland a stronghold for the Reformation? Friends, I wept when I saw this. It says, Pope Francis, daily record, February 7, 2016, Pope Francis expected to make his first visit to Scotland to sign the charter against extremism. When I saw that, I began to dig for the details. It says, leaders from different religions, diplomatic and community leaders will all gather in Fife Town to sign a 10-point declaration calling on whom? On all faiths to unite against radicalization. In that group was Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. The Pope has spoken out against what, friends? Terrorist groups who brainwash vulnerable young people and draw them into what? Extremist networks. Why in Scotland? Why not somewhere else? Why in Scotland? Hmm, friends? And he's calling them what? Extremists. Who does the Pope call extremists? His own words. He says those who refuse to build bridges with other religions and lay aside your system of belief and just unite with other religions and denominations. If you refuse to shake hand with Popery, shake hand with the Baptists, shake hand with the Orthodox, shake hand with Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and the Jewish people, by laying aside your system of belief, then you are an extremist right here he said red words he said fundamentalism extremism instead of creating a what bridge creates a wall that blocks encounter with another person it seeks ways to just disagree then he says watch he says bridges the pope speaking bridges they must be constructed step by step until you're able to what shake hand then he says he says bridges last and promote peace walls not only divide people but they must be defended which takes energy for this reason the walls need to be taken down not built then the pope is so bold he says anyway those walls are destined to fall we will build the bridge with whom? He says, friends, I want to build that bridge between the first schism in Catholicism, the Roman Catholics, and the Eastern Orthodox. Well, since yesterday, that bridge is built. And those who refuse to walk across that bridge and shake hands and lay aside truth, those who are putting up walls, they are extremists. 
And what must happen to them, Pope, he says, they must be fought against. Headline right there. Francis urges, world religions, do you see now? Once the bridge is built, then we can all unite to fight against those who are extreme. Come on, friends. That's one plus one equals two. Probation's hour is fast closing. Why in Scotland? I went back to the book, Great Controversy. Do you see why we do people a disfavor? We keep them in darkness when we refuse to give them the full, complete writing, wording of the book, The Great Controversy, not just an abridged version. Don't get me started. It says on page 250 of Great Controversy in Scotland, in Scotland, the seeds of truth scattered by Columba and his co-laborers had never been wholly destroyed for hundreds of years. After the churches of England submitted to Rome, those of Scotland maintained their freedom. The Lollards coming from England with the Bible and the teachings of Wycliffe did much to preserve the knowledge of the gospel. And every century had its witnesses and martyrs, Hamilton and Wishart princely in character as in birth with a long line of humbler disciples yielded up their lives at the stake but from the burning pile of wishart there came one whom the flames were not to silence one who under god was to strike the death knell of popery weir in scotland who was he what was his name? John Knox had turned away. Friends, when I read these things, chills just take over my body. Because what they went through, we have to go through. It makes no sense we think that we are okay. Blessed are whom? The poor in spirit. Those who see their need for spirituality. Those who see their need for the faith of Let's read that. John Knox had what? Turned away from what, friends? The traditions and what? Of which church? To feed upon the truths of God's word and the teaching of Wishart. Had confirmed his what? Determination to forsake the communion of Rome and join himself to whom? The persecuted reformers. Have you counted the cost? Chapter 13 of Revelation. Look with me, my friends, at verse number 15 to verse number 17. Blessed are whom? The poor in spirit. Write down on your notepaper, in your notebook. The poor, the poor in spirit will encounter the mark of the beast crisis. Come on, safe to serve. Local and international, take your notes, please. It says in verse number 15, are we together, friends? It says, uh, and he had power to give what, friends? Uh, life unto what? The image of the beast. Uh, that the image of the beast uh, should both what? Speak and what? Cause uh, that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be killed. Uh, hear me carefully. Is Paul making steps to bring about persecution, friends? Is he doing it? Is he doing it, friends? Look at verse 16. And he calls whom? And he calls all, both whom? But small and great. What is the next phrase? So what will the rich and the poor encounter? The mark of the beast the crisis. Verse 17. And we won't be able to buy or... Friends, could you please listen to me? And hear God's Holy Spirit, friends? The poor will encounter the mark of the beast crisis. And one of the ways in which Pope through her agents, will lead us, force us, to worship on Sunday when it become the law of the land and also say we can buy or sell, hear me, is to remove a cash society and make it a cash-less society. If we're spending cash, there's not much control over the paper money. Are we together, my friends? 
or together with a gold or silver, right? All right, don't buy gold, don't buy silver, amen. <laughs> Moving on, all right. But now, if they can take the money pool and make it all digital and say all you need is your phone and your phone does everything, all they have to do is to censor, to shut down your digital access to your bank, to this account, and that account, and very, very soon, you will not be able to what, buy or sell. Are steps being taken now? You say, oh, pastor, oh, you're just crying wolf. You're a crazy pastor. Look at this. It says, uh, Bloomberg Business, uh, February when? 12, 2016. It says, uh, Austrians should have, this is a heroic deputy economy, economy minister, he says, Austrians, let's read, should have the constitutional right to use cash to protect their privacy. Harold Maurer said, as the European Union considers curbing the use of banknotes and coins, we don't want someone to be able to track digitally what we buy, eat, and drink what books we read, what movies we watch, we will fight everywhere against rules. EU finance ministers vowed at a meeting in Brussels on Friday to crack down on what they call illicit cash movements. And the EU is now exploring the need for appropriate restrictions on cash payments exceeding certain thresholds. Right now, you can't even go to a bank and draw over a certain amount of money without filling out certain documents because they want to track your very movement. And that threshold is going to drop lower and lower until everything is, is digital. And they can press a button and shut you down. And you say, oh, you're just crying wolf. Okay, you keep saying that, friends. I'm telling you, the end of all things is at hand. What will the poor encounter? The mark of the beast crisis. And I'm telling you something here. Popery is putting things in place. Even the return of the Inquisition. The what, friends? Be in mind, when Popery rule the world to shut down the reformation she brought in the inquisition to spy on those who were sympathizing with the reformation and to persecute them imprison them and to martyr them well since the bible says popery will return then we have to expect a modern day inquisition friend. Great controversy 235. To give them what? Come on, let's read. To give them what? Greater power. To give who greater power? The Jesuits. And who is Pope Francis? A Jesuit. To give them greater power, a bull was issued re-establishing what? The Inquisition. Let's keep on down. In many countries, thousands upon thousands of the very flower of the nation, the purest and noblest, the most intellectual and highly educated, pious and devoted pastors, industrious and patriotic citizens, brilliant scholars, talented artists, skillful artisans, were slain or forced to do what? To flee to other what lands? Do you see here, rich or poor? Free or bond? Watch, it says, such were the means which Rome had invoked to do what? To quench the light of the Reformation, to withdraw from men the Bible, and to restore the ignorance and superstition of the Dark Ages, but under God's blessings and the labors of those noble men whom God had raised up to succeed Luther. Let's read. Protestantism was not overthrown. So what was the purpose of the Papal Inquisition, friends? To shut down the Protestant Reformation. What is the Pope's goal? To end the protest. So must we then expect 
a modern day inquisition is going on before our very eyes. Do you remember when the Pope met with Eric Schmidt of Google? What was that all about? Controlling the tech industry. Google giant and the CEO said to the Pope, whatever you want, we'll make it happen. Let's pass this. The Pope met with whom? Tim Cook of what company? Apple. Let's move on. He met with uh, Microsoft giant. Bill Gates, Facebook. Listen now, this came on a few days ago. Silicon Valley, the Guardian, Silicon Valley appears, what friends? Open to helping the U.S. spy agencies after terrorism summit. What does this mean? The remarkable rendezvous between whom? Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, and others. And a delegation from the White House revealed a willingness on the part of tech firms to work with whom? The government and indicated that the Obama administration appears to have concluded it cannot combat terrorists online on its own. Other technology companies present included LinkedIn, Dropbox, YouTube, Yahoo, and PayPal. My wife and I were talking and Christian, and my wife was sarcastically speaking, and she said, look at the word PayPal. Just take, remove the Y. What word is that? Just remove the Y. You get PayPal, my friends. And they are now uniting to what, friends? To shut down who they deem as terrorists, extremists, and who is leading the pack. The Pope of Rome, you say, I don't see the Pope here. But if you are a Bible-believing prophetic student, you'll understand America will form the image to Popery. So it's America that will reinstitute the Inquisition, the Papal Inquisition. Look, look, friends. It says uh, we are interested in exploring all options with you for how to deal with the growing threat of terrorists and other malicious actors. Who are those people? It says, are there technologies that could make it harder for terrorists to use the internet to mobilize, facilitate, and operationalize? This meeting confirmed that we are what? United in our goal to keep terrorists and terror-promoting material off the internet. And the Pope and Obama are on one accord. And who does the Pope call terrorists, extremists, fundament, those who refuse to walk over the bridge and shake hands with spiritualism, apostate Protestantism, and Roman Catholicism. These are extremists, terrorists. What's coming for us, friends? Watch, it says, uh, this was not the first time such a senior delegation has traveled to Silicon Valley, but the attempt by America's leading counter-terrorism officials to court tech executives was an unusual sight. Even Hillary Clinton and B Donald Trump have said, they have called on technology companies to effectively kick terrorists off the internet. So who are you going to vote for? You better vote for Jesus. Amen. It says the FBI and the NSA sometimes want American firms to keep terrorist accounts up and keep whom? And keep authorities in the loop. Father in heaven. Allow, give us eyes that we might see that the end of all things is upon us. The modern day inquisition is right upon us. Do we have the faith to make it? In Christ's name we pray. Look at Luke chapter 4 with me, friends. Do you see what's going on, my friends? So now, since we are so close to the end, who will receive the blessing? Who will make it in? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And what is that first application? Those who see their lack of spirituality. 
their lack of the Holy Spirit. And the second application, those who see their lack of the faith of Jesus to make it to daily crises. These are the individuals that shall be blessed. I want the experience. How about you? But we have to acknowledge that we are in need. We have to ask Jesus daily to supply all of our needs. Will you ask him today? Look at me first. Do you see your need? How close are we? And you think you are just going to walk unscathed into heaven? Luke chapter 4. Then if you see your need, what's the next step then, friends? To ask. What are you asking for? Dear God, give me that spirituality. Secondly, give me the faith of Jesus. How often must I ask? That means every day I must see my need. How often must you ask? Every day, so every day you must see your need. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, are we there? It's together what it says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach what, friends? The gospel to whom? To whom? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Look now how the Bible defines the poor. Who are the poor? Read on. It says, uh, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So who are the poor? Those who are experiencing a broken heart. That's me. Is that you, friends? Who are the poor? Those who are in captivity. Captivity to things. Captivity to sin. That's me. Is that you, friends? It makes no sense we say we are okay. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are the poor? Those who can acknowledge to God, I am blind. Blind spiritually. That's me. Is that you, friends? Or do you think you see? If you say you see, then your sins remain on you. So now, do you see? No. Are you blind? Amen. Bible says, those who are poor in spirit are those who acknowledge they have been bruised by Satan. I have been bruised. Have you been bruised? And what is the solution? Verse number 18 again. Christ says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? He hath anointed me to preach what? The gospel to the poor. So what do I need to heal my broken heart? So what do you need to heal your broken heart? How many of you have experience a broken heart because of a spouse a loved one who can heal you friends only Christ what will he use the gospel how many of us are in captivity to some sin in the life does Christ want to deliver us what will he use the gospel how many of us are blind have been bruised what does Christ want to impart to us to bring healing? It is the gospel. How is the gospel defined? Let's quote Romans chapter 1 verse 16. We know it. Come on. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes. Pause right there, friends. To everyone that believes. How many of us are going through a broken heart right now? I got my two hands up. Raise your hand, friends. So how will Christ heal us? What will he send? The gospel. But we must what? Believe. So today, we must say, dear God, give me the strength. Give us the strength to believe. You can heal my broken heart. Will you say it, friends? Will you say it? Dear God, thank you today and give me strength to believe you will deliver me from captivity. Go to James chapter 2 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? James chapter 2. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We must acknowledge that we lack spirituality. We must acknowledge we lack the faith of Jesus Christ. Ask him to supply our need. Why? 
because we want to be saved. We want to end the suffering our sins have brought upon him. Ask him daily because we realize the end of all things is at hand. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So when I come to him, Jesus will transition me from being poor in spirit, lacking spirituality, lacking the faith of Jesus, and he will make me rich. When you come to him, say, dear God, I lack spirituality. Dear God, I lack the faith of Jesus. He will not leave us empty. He will give us riches. I want it. How about you, friend? And it's not temporal riches. It's being rich in faith. James chapter 2. Look at verse 5 with me. Are we there, my friends? Let's go together. What it says in verse 5 of James 2. It says, hearken. My beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor, the who, friends? The poor of this world, rich in faith, and let's read, and heirs of what? Of the kingdom, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So once we see your need, do you see your need today, friends? Of this spirituality? Do you see your need for the faith of Jesus Christ? So once I come to him daily, once you come to Christ daily, will he make us rich and rich in faith? And then will he save us? Yes. Second Corinthians. Go there with me. Second Corinthians chapter 8. But friends, it cost Jesus something to make us rich. Father, help us to get this. It cost Jesus a great sacrifice to make us rich. The Bible says uh, Jesus became poor so I can become rich in faith. Oh, friends, Jesus became poor so you may have the opportunity to become rich in faith and be saved. And today I say, thank you, Jesus. What do you say, friends? What do you say? I say, thank you, Jesus. Let's read it, friends. And this is what softens my heart. Jesus gave up so much, so I, who was once poor, can now become rich in faith. Oh, friends. Jesus became poor, gave up so much, so you, who are spiritually void, you who lack the faith of Jesus, can now become rich in faith, rich spiritually. I say, thank you, Jesus. What do you say, friends? Second Corinthians chapter 8. Are we there? Verse number 9, it says, together, read slowly what it says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be what? Rich. The songwriter says, Christ says, I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? It cost Jesus something. So my friends, if I were to stop right now and the Holy Spirit was to make an appeal right now. Who wants to give his life to Jesus because of his great condescension? He who was once rich, gave up all, became poor. Oh, friends, that we who lack spirituality, lack the faith of Jesus, might become rich. One day Christ said to Judas Iscariot, Judas, you love money too much. You love money more than salvation. And Christ said to him, foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. But the son of man have not weir to lay his head. I can't fathom that. Leaving all of glory to come down here. So I, so you may have the opportunity to become rich spiritually. Rich in the faith of Jesus and become saved. And all we do now is say, Jesus, 
keep your experience and insult a God. Insult a God. Where is the heart, friends? What love is this? What love is this? Look with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This love that Christ demonstrated, was he rich? Yes. Did he become poor? Yes. For whose purpose? For whose benefit? For mine and for yours. And Christ is now saying, all of us who profess to be Christians, all of us who have seen his condescension, he who was once rich now has become poor. Jesus now says, you in turn must become poor so others can become rich spiritually. Now, write down on your paper the third application. Blessed are the poor in spirit, which means blessed are those who become poor so others can become rich spiritually. Here it is. Blessed are those who make sacrifices daily so others can be saved by Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You have them now, the three applications. And there's one more, but come back this evening. 2 Corinthians 6. Look at verse 10 with me. Are we there, my friends, in verse 10? What it says here, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. Let Paul become poor so others may have the opportunity to become rich spiritually. Rich in faith. Why? Because Paul's gaze was fixed on Jesus. And we're told in that book, Sons and Daughters of God, page 260 through page 262, those who have their gaze fixed upon Christ. Their life will find its center. Duty becomes a delight. And sacrifice for Jesus and for souls become a pleasure. Our gaze must be fixed upon Jesus. Friends, soul winning costs Jesus everything. And soul winning will cause us, cause us everything. But there's a blessing, eternal life. Yes, we who were once rich must now become poor, making sacrifices so others can become rich. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says there will be no starless crown in heaven. None, friends. So now, will you come out to the health seminar? So now, will you come with us? Let's go and knock on doors and sow gospel seeds in central Florida. Will you, friend? Yes. Will you walk with Jesus? Yes. Will you make sacrifices? 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10, it says, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. Soul winning may bring sorrow to our hearts. And one great sorrow I have is this. Many times, the souls Jesus sent me to try and help, they turn around and spit in my face. You're a fanatic. We don't want to hear that. You're too extreme. But when I look at Jesus, he knew how they would treat him. He came nevertheless. And the very souls Jesus came to save, they grabbed him and led him to a cliff almost to throw him down to kill him. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. He walked away. And guess what? Did he go and hide? He went back witnessing. Witnessing. They beat, they bruised, Peter, James, and John, and they brushed off themselves and went right back. Did they become poor, friends? So I'm sorry for you if you are afraid of name calling. I'm sorry for you if you're afraid of finger pointing. Were you not with that ministry called Safe to Serve? I'm sorry for you if you don't have 
the strength to make it daily. Someone sent me an email just yesterday saying, Pastor, I used to preach your sermons. But now, God has told me what you're preaching is error. And this is a person all the way from in the eastern countries in Europe there, emailing me, send me your sermon notes, send me your sermon, I want to preach your sermons. And he began preaching them. But in the sermons, I'm dealing with sins both in the world and in the church. So I guess he preached those things too. And the persecution from the church brethren came upon him. And now he has turned around saying, something is wrong with the message. I sent him back an email. You didn't count the cost. I sent him back an email with much prayer. And I said, the problem is you are fighting in another man's armor. You did not pray and fast and study for yourself for Christ to give you your own message, your own armor. Borrowing from me won't help you. What God has given to me, that's my armor. I fast, I pray. I went to my bed last night, 2.30 in Heaven's Bakery. That's baking, baking the bread. Where is your armor? David could not fight in King Saul's armor. Where is your armor? And instead of going to God and saying, Dear God, I believe the message. Persecution is coming. Churchmen, Seventh-day Adventists, don't want preachers to expose the apostasies in, the, in this church. But they will allow these apostates in the church to go on social media and proclaim these heresies. And if you dare say anything, you are the extremist. But we are told God would not honor any man with smooth messages. That we must bear a more pointed testimony than that which was born by John the Baptist. And John told Herod, that's not your wife. John told, and that was a civil power, Herod, the king of the Jews. And John told the priests and the Pharisees and scribes, you generation of vipers. And he did so not in secret, but on the banks of Jordan, when souls were coming to be baptized. Why? Because public sins demand public rebuke, but do it in love. Because duty, stern duty, must have a twin sister. If duty and kindness are blended, we are told a decided advantage will be gained, volume 3, 108. But then they say, Pastor, you're not loving. You don't preach with love. <laughs> Jesus says, to whom shall I liken you people? John came preaching, not spearing, and you said, John has a devil. And the son of man come. And I'm sitting with you. I'm eating with you. And you say, I'm a drunkard. I'm a wine bibber. You cannot be satisfied. It doesn't matter how we present truth. Those who don't see their need will find a problem with it. So make sure you fast, you pray, you count the cost, you go to Jesus, let him give you your message. Fight in your own armor. Because whatever you say will be brought back to you. And men would twist it. Jesus once said, destroy this temple. In three days, I'll raise it up. This he said, speaking of his body. But at the closing scenes, they said, he said he would destroy the government. He said he would destroy the church. And they put him on the cross for that, friends. And other sins, other lies, I should say. Other lies. Where's your armor? Have you counted the cost? Matthew chapter 19. So, beloved, sorrow is going to fill our hearts. But we have to remember, Jesus knew he would have to make a great sacrifice Yet people will spit in his face. But Jesus came nevertheless. Safe to serve local. Safe to serve international. Right now, these, these sermons, these Bible studies are sweet to us. 
But very, very soon, for some, it's going to be bitter in the belly. So if we do not have faith and the faith of Jesus, if we don't have a true spirituality by seeing our need and asking Christ daily for strength to make it, we are going to give up present truth. It's going to happen, friends. As I always tell those at our training school, if, if somebody is dead and you touch the dead person, does that dead have feelings? No. So if I die daily, if you die to Christ daily, whatever people say to you and do to you, you will not respond negatively because you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. We have to die to self. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why am I troubling you today? It's not me, for it's the Holy Spirit. Because some of us came saying, I know this already. No, Matthew chapter 19. What did Christ say to that rich young ruler? Go and what? Take all your, your riches and do what? Sell and what? Give to the poor. All right, and you shall have what? Treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. And the Bible says he went away how? Sorrowful. Pause right there. This was, this was the same rich young ruler who said, all those commandments, I've kept all of them. But guess where was lacking? Was he selfish? But let me add this. Let me add this in your ears. That rich young ruler was not putting his gaze on Jesus. Do you see it? He was unwilling to make the sacrifice. Yet when I see Jesus, who was once rich and became poor, my friends, I'm willing to give up everything so souls can be saved. No, don't say amen yet. What if you have to give up your family ties so others can be saved? Because still being with those family members will cause you to compromise and to cause your fiery zeal to become extinguished. Are you willing to give up? Are you willing to become poor? Do you see it now, friends? Are you willing to give up friendship and things and people so that you may do God's will so others can become rich if you say yes. The only way we can do it and maintain the experience is to keep our gaze fixed on whom? On Jesus. He gave up everything. Philippians 2 says, Jesus thought it not robbery. Finish it. To be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And took upon himself the form of a whom? Of a servant. Jesus came to serve. But he became poor. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus said for us, my friends, my God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was willing to be separated from his father's presence. He became sin for me, became sin for you. So we who were and are still poor might become spiritual, have the opportunity to receive the faith of Jesus. Jesus did that for me. Jesus did that for you. And all he asks of us, sell all that you have, give to the poor. That's all, friends. So is he calling for literature evangelists? Is he calling for medical missionaries? Is he calling for Bible workers? Is he calling for preachers? Is he calling for the, the Dorcases? He's calling for all hands on deck. This is not just some sermon, friends. God is calling for action. Action, friends, and watch. The rich young ruler walked away, right? In contrast, write down, Mark, come on, write down, Mark chapter 12. 
Mark 12, uh, verse 42 through verse 44, the Bible says there was a poor widow. A who, friends? A poor widow. A widow, a woman. Who does a woman typify in Scripture? The church. And the Bible says this poor widow, she put in more than those rich men. They put in of their abundance, but she of her poverty, she gave all the poor widow. That's why Jesus says, don't trouble her. We must give all for Jesus Christ. All for him. Look with me as we close. Psalm 34. Where are we going to, my friends? Oh, beloved, we must see Jesus. Too many times our sermons, our Bible studies stop at just looking at Jesus. Friends, we must look at Jesus, but then we have to look at the lost sheep. Look at Jesus. Then look at the lost sheep in the mountain top with Jesus. But coming down to where? The valley to reach the souls, friends. 2016, the year for aggressive evangelism. Satan is not playing games. Satan is not at ease. Inspiration says, look at Satan, even though we can't see him. If you look at Satan, he's never at ease. And that's why God must give him a thousand years of vacation and then deal with him. He's never at ease. Never at ease, my friends. Amos chapter 6 verse 1. Woe unto those who are at ease in Zion. So yes, look at Jesus. What he gave up for us. But now, let's look at the lost sheep. Those in seven-day Adventism. Those in Babylon. It's time to go to work. But you can't work without looking at Jesus. Because this work is not something for the weak-minded and the feeble knees. No, friends. Persecution from within and from without. Friends, let me tell you something. I'm going through so much. Sometimes I have to go back and read the account of Martin Luther. Because what went on with Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, when churchmen turned against him, we are told in great controversy, Martin Luther once began to think, I wonder if I'm the one who is in error. How can I see it? But these folks can't see it. Maybe I'm the one. And that's why Martin Luther spent so much time in prayer. So much so, he wrote, and Sister White penned him, he wrote saying, he even dread leaving his study to go and eat. And in Great Controversy, page 210, she says, Luther did not allow one day to pass without spending at least, what well, she says, at least three hours in prayer. Wow. Listen, 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 listen. During the struggle at Augsburg, Luther did not pass a day without devoting three hours at least to prayer. Listen. And they were hours selected from those the most favorable to study. Listen. In the privacy of his chamber. Can you see him by faith? In the privacy of his chamber, he was heard. To pour out his soul before God in words full of adoration. In words full of fear. And hope as when one speaks to a friend. Was he born to the point of fear? Yes. But guess what? He was still singing the songs of Zion. And that cheered him along the way. Even if you can't sing, make a joyful noise. When he felt everyone had forsaken him. Luther, you are the problem in the church. 
in my home, Luther, I can just imagine, because of Luther's ministry, husband, divorce, wife. If you will follow that message, I'll go my way. Why? I want my wife I was married to five years ago. You have changed. And Luther being blamed for marriages falling apart. You can't blame Luther. Jesus says, I come to bring a sword. You can't blame Luther. He's only the messenger. But he felt so much burden, Luther wept every day. Food couldn't console him. It was the word of life. The bread of life, friends. This is no joke. It says, watch. It says, uh, he was praying this. I know that thou art our father and our God, he said, and that thou will scatter the persecutors of thy children. For thou art thyself endangered with us. All this matter is yours. And it is only by thy constraint that we have put our hands on the work. Defend us then, O oh Father. And all the arrows and swords that were unsheathed and sent after Martin Luther to kill him, they couldn't catch him. Amen. Because God needed a voice. Friends. And today, God needs voices. Yes, friends. We can talk about this reformation and we are true Protestants, but we need the spirit of the faithful Protestants. And their fervor, zeal, and attitude came from Jesus. In other words, Martin Luther was saying, I am poor in spirit. That's what he was saying. I'm empty. And then we're told, from those secret places of prayer of Martin Luther came the power that shook the world in the great days of the Reformation. And the same power, even greater power, is coming again. I want to be one of those messengers. Do you, my friends? But we have to look to whom? Jesus, once rich, became poor, so I can receive riches. But now, what must we do? Become poor, make sacrifices for what purpose? So others can become rich. So no more putting money in banks. Let's on this earth, let's put the money in the banks of heaven. Yes, friends. We have to make sacrifices for the cause. Have you seen Jesus, friends? Have you seen him? I must see my need. Do you see your need for it, friends? Here's the encouragement. Psalm 34 verse 6 says what? Come on, what it says in closing. What it says. My time is up. Father, I have done what you have asked. Even more what you have just given to me. Give your people now this last point. Encourage us in Christ's name. Verse 6 now, what it says. Come on. This poor man what? This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and what friends? And saved him out of how many? All his troubles. I'm going through troubles. Physically, emotionally, are you? Financially? What will God do for us? He will save us out of all our troubles. But who must cry? Who cried here? Who must cry again? The poor man must cry. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Ah, oh, friends. So when I acknowledge I'm poor and cry unto him, will he save me out of all my troubles? When you acknowledge you are poor and cry unto him, will Jesus, our Savior, save you from all your troubles? I believe it. Do you believe it, friends? I can hear somebody saying, 
Just put some water in the baptismal pool. Amen. With such a message, I want to recommit my life to Jesus. Who wants to give his life to God right now? Hands down. Father in heaven, Lord, 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 Lord. Let's kneel. Come on. Safe to serve international. Join us on our knees before Jesus. Let's humble ourselves. This poor man cried. The Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles, from all his troubles. Father in heaven, we recommit our lives to you today. As we looked at the life of Martin Luther, we aren't there yet. And yet we're so happy when we hear about current events. But we don't have the experience like a Martin Luther to meet it. And what Martin Luther encountered is going to be worse for us in these last days. So Martin Luther's experience is not enough for us. We need a greater and deeper experience with you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who see their need. We look at you, our Savior Jesus. In Gethsemane, you realized you needed greater power and you received it. Not my will, Father, but thine be done. An angel came down and strengthened you for the crisis. Do we see our need? Now we must be having a Gethsemane experience. Save us, dear God. Quicken our footsteps now that we may go forward in aggressive evangelism, not fearing what the state can do, not fearing what the NSA, the FBI, what Google, what Apple, what Yahoo, what PayPal, what YouTube, what none of these folks can do. Fear not man, but Jesus. The voice must be heard in these last days. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Both for the church and for the world. Not fearing what family members and friends and church members say. We have to give an account to you. You could have kept silent to preserve yourself. But no, you went aggressively preaching present truth with love. Give us that experience, dear God. Give it to us. Friends, March 5th is our baptism. Who wants to send God the signal? Lord, I want to be baptized. I want to be rebaptized. Why not raise your hand for Jesus right now? He raised his hand for you. He became poor. He became poor. Hands down. Anyone else? He became poor. That you may become rich. Is there one more for Jesus? Is there one more for Jesus? Father, seal every decision today. And even though we went over time in our lesson today help us not to lose any of its power it's life-changing power in christ's name we pray and the church said amen amen, amen.